So welcome uh, back, those of you who have joined us again um, for another 30 or 40 minutes together. Brad is uh, teaching a class um, and we've asked Roger Newell, who's still working on his audio down in the left-hand corner, if you've got Hollywood squares like we do, um, to sub in for Brad. Um, I'll let Baxter tell a story about Roger's relationship to Baxter and his doctorate, maybe a little bit later. Um, what we wanted to talk about today um, was a little bit about uh, the topic of salvation, kind of a big topic, <laughs> just a tad. Um, but eventually heading towards the question of why did Jesus die? I think this is um, especially pertinent being that we're coming up on Holy Week um, next week, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then obviously Easter Sunday. And um, I think this is something that we've thought a lot about. And one of the things I want to say is that <clears throat> for all of us, and I think one, this is one of the reasons why um, I'll skip that. I'll just say for all of us, what we have been learning and continue to learn as we contemplate and think about um, the brilliance of God's plan in saving us by Jesus um, coming, uh, the incarnation as a, as a man, it, uh, it's gripped all of us. It's transforming us. Um, it's changing us. Uh, not, um, not so much on what we should be, but renewing what we are. So, um, so I want to begin, and I'm, again, I'm going to lob this one to Baxter to begin us, um, but I want to read a quote before we do it, because I know this will kind of get him moving. Doesn't take much though to get him. <laughs> um, the paradox at the heart of Christianity is that the Son of God entered into fallen Adamic existence without ceasing to be the Son of God. The life of the Trinity intersected the brokenness of fallen human existence. How is this possible? How could the fellowship of the Trinity penetrate Adam's hiding? The answer is that it is not possible. Something has to give. Something has to change. Either the fellowship of the Father, Son, and Spirit grinds to an eternal halt, or Adamic existence is fundamentally reordered or restructured. Either the love of the triune God is broken, or Adamic flesh is converted to God. There has to be a conversion, a fundamental restructuring, restructuring either in the being and character of God or in the being and character of Adam. That's a quote from Dr. Kruger from uh, a small book that he wrote called The Undoing of Adam. So Baxter, why don't you start us and we'll get going. Oh, all right. Uh, a couple of things. Since you were doing threes yesterday, I'll do three. Um, <laughs> first, um, the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit is a relationship of love. And it is, there is an indivisible oneness in their relationship. And so for me, that's, that's a non-negotiable. That's Nicaea. That's a, an indivisible oneness. They're not the same person, but they are so together. They dwell in one another completely. Um, and so many, uh, most of what we grew up with in terms of atonement theory was the, the um, penal substitutionary model, which sort of celebrates the fact that the father turned his back upon his son, which raises all kinds of theological objections and questions for me. I'll just cut through that and just say that any notion, any notion that there's a separation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is to me a first order blasphemy. It's anathema. I know, you know, many people have held that, that's fine, but I want to be on record to say that they have lost their minds. Uh, this story is not about the father needing to be changed in fact when you go read the gospels and i'll read one verse from matthew uh, from that time jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day that's repeated in the synoptics and repeated again 
in John and in the book of Acts and in Hebrews. Um, the basic point that I want to make uh, with respect to why the cross is um, first, if the if the the death of Jesus is about an Old Testament sacrifice, there would have been nothing more necessary than somebody to put him on the altar and slit his throat and let him bleed out. What we encounter in the Gospels is this intense uh, anger coming from the human race, not from the Father. Uh, we butchered him. We abused him. We we mocked him. We beat him. We um, hoisted him up on the cross. And this. The reason this was necessary was not to appease an angry God. It was necessary because Jesus had to get to the bottom of the problem. He had to, to get to the bottom of our delusion. He had to get inside, as I was saying in the quote from uh, Jesus and Undoing of Adam, or John was reading, he had to get inside our delusion. So he is submitting himself to us at our most wicked worst. What we brought to the table was a murderous apostasy. It was covenant breaking. And we, as the human race, acting in the figures of Caiaphas and Judas and Pilate and the Roman soldiers and the priest, we hoisted Jesus on that cross and handed him back to the Father. And we rejected him. And the stunning thing is, to me, is that Papa takes and accepts our rejection of his son and turns that into uh, our adoption. He, he meets us there in our rejection of Jesus and embraces us and turns that into the mercy seat. We rejected Jesus. He turned our rejection into salvation. And I can see this in John's gospel. It's almost as if when Judas comes to Jesus to betray him, it's, it's almost as if I can see Jesus winking at Judas and said, Judas, we accept your betrayal of me, and we just want you to know we're going to turn this into the salvation of the human race. And that is the most mind-boggling part of uh, the sacrifice. Jesus laid down in life, didn't just die. He died at our hands, and we didn't just kill him. We abused him and rejected him and pushed him out, and the Father, Son, and Spirit turned that into the new covenant. It's the mercy seat. It's the place in the universe where the, the, the fallen sons and daughters of Adam at their most wicked worst were embraced and accepted and loved. And that was turned into the everlasting and met with everlasting mercy. That's the mercy seat. And that's what I was trying to get at in the quote part of it. But I think that's a much, much more obviously biblical way of looking at the, the sacrifice of Jesus. And I'm certain that that's exactly what John is teaching in his gospel by the very structure of it and the way he goes about that. So I'll let somebody else talk now. <laughs> okay, we were all kind of mesmerized there for a second. So. Hmm. Thoughts, comments. It has yeah. changed me more than anything I've ever seen. Um, that that it, in, in a way, and T.F. Torrance talks about this, he talks about learning, or he talks about coming to love God not for anything you can get from him, but for himself. And I used to put, used to think, well, how can you do that? We're all trying to get saved. But it's when you see that what I contributed, when I saw that I contributed faithlessness, betrayal, murder, mockery, and we together as a human race crucified the eternal word and the eternal son of the father. And they used that as the glue, so to speak, to hold me in their arms. So I don't have to get anything right. My qualification was that I got it all wrong. Now I can relax and now I can marvel and begin to love the Father, Son, and Spirit for their sakes. Mm -hmm. so, Paul, you were going to say something. No, I was mesmerized with you. So okay. um, <laughs> one, uh, uh, another way to, to look at what is going on and it is so layered this is why you know there are thousands of books written about this topic there is so much going on and um for me one of them is the whole descent into our illusion of separation as so jesus not only has to meet our need as horrendous as it is for a sacrifice. This is not God's need. 
God doesn't need God the Father doesn't need a sacrifice or or Jesus would have to have one too you know it's it's like no God the Father this is not about God needing a sacrifice this is about us in our delusion believing that a sacrifice is needed and what you have through the Hebrew scriptures is you have the constant submission of God to our religious delusions which are all about separation sacrifice and magic um, and um, and so God climbs into a religious system that is uh, a about requiring an other to sacrifice for my benefit and he becomes the sacrifice for our benefit and um and self-giving love which is the expression of it right but also part of it for me is that this is a descent into the delusion of separation because i don't believe separation is actually real it's not real we're created in christ we're never separated from the embrace of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Adam never was. And um, although he entered some mystery of iniquity that, that created a delusion, that he self-created a delusion that he was separated. And that is the first not good in Genesis, the, the delusion of separation. It's not good that the man, Adam, be in his separation. And... Um, and the Hebrew has a, has a much stronger phrase than our idea that he's just alone. It's like, oh, oh we, we forgot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you just address this for a second? Sure. The separation, and this will be to all of us, but to you first, the separation seems very real to us. Yeah. Okay. So that reinforces in yeah. our minds and hearts that it is real. Okay. So can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. There's a lot of things that seem real to us that aren't. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, so uh, but we, we experience, that, experience them as though they're real. You know, for, for example, it seems real to us that God doesn't love us. It, it seems real to us that God has abandoned us. Um, and and this is a God who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. But our experience of our delusion has so penetrated into the depths of our being that we consider the illusion itself to be that which is real and not the reality. Um, and so, uh, you know, the way Jesus related to death itself was that it was not real. Not, it isn't life. In fact, if you don't have life, death is not even possible. The, the illusion of, of the loss of life or the uh, separation from life isn't even possible. Anything that is, has its own existence inside the reality of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's real. So you can, if you can have it, if you can have freedom without bondage, of course you can, then freedom is real. But bondage isn't. It's, it's an expression of some form of abandonment of the real, right? Light is real. Darkness, not, right? Um, uh, love is real. And fear is not. Fear mm -hmm. is embedded in, an, in a delusion of mm -hmm. some form of separation from love. Because what? There is no fear in love. And that is a being statement. There is no fear in love. So inside of love, fear does not exist. So we have to bring it in as some form of illusion. Um, and, um, but it's, it's very real to us. F fear is very real to us, right? But it's because we don't know yet how much we're loved. That's First John. You know, perfect love casts out fear. The one who fears is not perfected, is not whole inside of love and so we're the ones that are broken and we bring we bring into this union with god our own brokenness and god embraces it and that's also part of the incarnation he's god is going to go to the depths of our illusion into the depths of our sense of abandonment and alienation not just 
into the very real stuff, but into the illusion, which we're lost inside of. That's why it seems so real to us. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, <laughs> I'm a little distracted by, by uh, Roger's tail here. And <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, can. we Roger, can. Yeah. Welcome, Roger. <laughs> So anyway, right, that's, <laughs> that's a, as the old Tulsa, as the old Tulsa preacher would say about Paul's uh, sermonette there. <clears throat> Praise hallelujah. Praise, Praise hallelujah. hallelujah. <clears throat> oh my gosh, it, Lord. So we need yeah. an introduction for Roger before we we yeah. spin out even more. But uh, now that he can okay. hear us and we can hear him, so back to you. Want to do that? You want to you want to do that? I will do that. Roger Newell, Doctor Roger Newell is a fellow graduate of the University of Aberdeen King's College. He was ahead of me by several years and he went after that to uh, down in England as a pastor, a priest. And then when I submitted my doctoral dissertation, guess who was one of the external examiners? Mm -hmm. Good old Roger himself. And uh, it was a long story, but I'll make it short as I can. I was supposed to be there at 2.30. So I got there at two o'clock and waited outside and 2.15 came, there was no one. Uh, 2.30 came, there was no one. 2.45 came, there was no one. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm you know, biggest day of my life and I'm, I messed up, I'm, I'm in the wrong place. And somewhere about 30 minutes late, here comes Roger and two other professors. And they sit, they go in and say, well, we ought to get you in a minute, so they did. And uh, then I had to go in and I sat down and Roger was very kind, they were all very kind to me. And I was, I kept sitting on the edge of my seat saying, when's the thunder coming? And it, it was a beautiful uh, discussion once I relaxed a little bit. Then they send you out and they make their decision and bring you back in. And, but right before I went out, John Thompson leaned over and he quoted some Latin thing about three or four sentences, it seemed like to me. And he looked at me and I just said, yeah, of course. <laughs> I had no idea what it was. Uh, passion's progress. Roger, no. Roger, that's Roger. Roger. Roger's book. I couldn't see the, the uh, yep, that's Roger Dodger's book. Get it and read it. Um, anyway, um, that, that was my, that's when Roger became my really, really, really good friend was that day. <laughs> <laughs> he taught for years and years and years out at George Fox. I think he's retired now, um, technically. That's I right. Hope, I hope he's doing some more writing, but you can't have Carl Bart and John Calvin on the same bookshelf overlooking your studies there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roger, we're glad to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Well, Baxter, Thank you. The, reason, the reason he does is that one of them is trying to save the other one. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh-oh. Uh okay. Okay. So we're, uh, That's, we were back to our conversation. Katie was about to jump in there with something about illusion and delusion well, and well, i was just gonna say to john's question or john's statement about um the separation seeming real is that from a neurological perspective our what our brain believes to be true is true it just yeah. it, it's true to our brain and so um and that's a pretty powerful force i mean i often talk about shame which to me is anything that we believe that's not of god is the most powerful force apart from grace. And you can't talk someone out of it. Mm. I think uh, maybe one thing to uh, bring in here uh, is that sometimes in America, we've been uh, influenced by this uh, power of positive thinking school, you know, goes back mm. to Thoreau and, uh, uh, you know, some of the, uh, earliest uh, philosophers in our country and then it gets it morphs and it comes down into uh, contemporary uh, times with people like uh, Norman Vincent Peale and the power of positive thinking and so on and it, at its worst it, it becomes kind of a mind game you know where uh, and of course Christian science had this uh, this legacy too you know uh, that if you're sick it's just uh, because you have a wrong attitude and, and you can you can overcome it all through mental re recovery or reconditioning or whatever and and so uh, there is a, a certain kind of you might want to say from a christian point of view a heresy that denies the reality of evil that denies the reality of of uh, the, the the fact that you know when people suffer it's not just an illusion it's it's real and uh 
So I think part of what we, we do when we talk about these things is we don't want to fall over into that category, that camp, and just say, yeah, if you're feeling sick, it's just in your head. Or if you're feeling abandoned, you know, it's just because you've got to, if you feel abandoned, then that's, that's real. And, and the good news is that Christ meets us where we are. And even if that is uh, objectively speaking or ontologically uh, some kind of a illusionary place, that's where he breaks in and meets us. Pitched his tent inside the darkness. So you, yeah. in, in a way you could say then, the, these illusions have real consequences. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So I have had several conversations with uh, a friend who keeps wanting to insist that there's a penalty for sin. And uh, he, he would agree that God doesn't need to be appeased, but that somehow God instituted this penalty, which then comes back to God. <laughs> um, well, in my thinking, because if you God, turn from life, I mean, there's a consequence for that. Right. And so there's a difference between consequence and penalty. Penalty implies that someone has, is doing something in regard to your, your actions or belief or whatever. Would that be fair to say? I, I just, I, I think if we talk about, when we talk about penalty, at least I will say it on a personal level, in my mind and in my heart, when I heard that language, I immediately assumed and did for decades that someone has instituted or set up that there is a penalty for what you do. And I will enforce this penalty, hence the law. I will enforce this penalty for what you've done. And Jesus comes to suffer the penalty that we should have suffered. And that's the narrative that I grew up with. And we all do. yeah, and we're suggesting a very different narrative. Yeah, he Basically, oh, sorry. I'm just let me finish the sentence. Basically, because it seems to me we've we've assumed certain things about the ontology or the being of God, and then read the Bible that way mm. that reinforced that narrative. Would that be fair, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Baxter, what were you going to say? I, yeah. I was going to just to add that that in Jesus's submission to us, in His indivisible oneness with His Father and the Holy Spirit, He's going all the way down to the bottom of the abyss where He cannot see them, and He cannot feel them, and there He He uh, bow He gives Himself to His Father, and that in in essence, what He's done is He has brought the the unspeakable, overflowing beautiful life of the Father, Son, and Spirit into our delusion set up shop. And now it's the Holy Spirit's work and, and joy to turn the lights on inside our darkness. And uh, I don't know if you guys have, have actually been with people who were delusional. Katie, you probably had several over the years, but I, I have. I went to the doctor. I mean, I went to the hospital to see a friend who, who was, she knew that who I was, but that was it. And she got very angry with me because I would not participate with her in her way of understanding what was going on. And I just said, how do you reach somebody's delusion? Well, you have to get on the inside. And that's what the incarnation and the, the self-giving of Jesus and eventually the becoming flesh on the cross is what Jesus was doing. And so that gives me all kinds of hope because it means, and I said this to my dad when he was beginning to lose his mind. I, I read to him John 17, 26. I wrote it on a post-it note that Father, I have made your name known to them and I will make you known in order that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. That's the purpose of the cross is he's going to bring his relationship and his own knowing of the Father's heart inside our delusion, inside of us, and the Spirit can turn the lights on and then we're going to get into an argument for 30, 40, 50, 60 years or maybe longer, but in the end, we're going to come to know the truth and it sets us free. And I wrote that for my dad and I put, I said, I, 
Father, I have made you known to them, to Don Kruger, and I will make you known. And that that is Jesus, the good shepherd, taking responsibility for his bride. I refuse to allow you to live in a delusion and I will lay down my life in order to get, to get inside it so that we can begin to see, you can begin to see with my eyes and feel with my heart and know what I know when I hear my father speak my name in the joy of the Holy Spirit. It's almost just almost unbelievable, but that is the, that is the gospel. So John, I, I, I oh, sorry, go ahead, Kenneth. Uh, so I, I want to, I want to try to respond to John's question by, by playing with a concept that I haven't fully formed yet. And it goes like this. If we distinguish penalty from consequence, like, like there is something that God must, uh, there is a law in which God is required to enact if you perform a certain way, right? Mm -hmm which means that and for that kind of a penalty to exist, there has to and exist something greater than God that God must submit to that is contrary to the very nature and being of God. <clears throat> Not contrary, but is outside of that. So, so God is coerced by the law that requires a penalty. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying oh, yeah, to get at? Totally, I'm with you completely. Okay. Okay, so, so law then, that law would be actually superior to, to love because God is love, right? Yep. So that, I think that's why it grinds on us to think that, well, there's, and God's like, shoot, what can I do? There's, right. I have to enact this penalty, right? So there's a problem. I'll murder my son. <laughs> I'll murder Kenneth, my son. You, you it's no forgiveness. It's I'm sorry. I said that there is, it, on the penal model, there is no forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That's not forgiveness. That's just some sort of warped justice. He mm -hmm. took our punishment, and so everything's fine. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is the other way around. It's the Father, Son, and Spirit forgiving us from the very beginning, but they're concerned about the fact we can't believe that, and we cannot receive it. So Jesus is coming. He's incarnating the forgiveness, the forgiveness of the Father. And he's going to find his way inside our darkness and begin to teach us that this is the truth of our so, being. It's almost like if God has, if this, if this law or these principles are above God that he has to submit to, it's almost like he has to do that in order to be able to forgive us. Hmm. And then it's just some kind of external pronouncement thing. It doesn't really change anything in us at least it seems that way to me legal fiction yeah so um perfect uh i i ran into a little line i, I love these sentences of jensen's robert jensen um the gospel claims to be the last judgment let out ahead of time not guilty justified <laughs> good um so the 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 gospel is that there the last judgment has already taken place you remember um when james and john are are arguing after the transfiguration they're heading into jerusalem and jesus is telling them you know what's this conversation you have with elijah and moses and you know it, it's about the cross and they're like you know who's gonna be at your right and your left in your kingdom um and uh, he said, only the father, you know, that's, that's other, someone else is appointed. That's somebody else. That's already been appointed. Who's going to be my right, my left. Well, where does he come into his kingdom? He comes into his kingdom on the cross. And the persons on his right and his left are criminals. And he's murdered with them. And from that throne, there's a judgment. There's a, a last judgment that has already been unleashed in the world prior to the last judgment. And that judgment is, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. While these, these are people that are actively killing and torturing him and mocking him and so forth and so on. In the act of, of, of abomination, this act of, of, of savagery of the human race upon its God. And... Um, 
in that, in that moment, he pronounces, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And that's not a negotiation between the, the, the son and the father. This is not the son trying to convince the father because I love them, please love them, because I love them, please forgive them. He's praying the heart of his father back to the father because they've always had this conversation. This is mm -hmm. a, a eternal word. He only says what he hears the father see, saying. He only does what he sees the father doing. And so there's this, he's, he's, uh, he's disclosing with that judgment. Um, all judgment's been given to the son. He's disclosing with those words the final judgment. Um, and that's the gospel. Beautiful. Oh, yes. Well said. Get so away. To, so to add, a, uh, and add another piece to this, is God, well, if justice is just love, then is God doing what we do, and that is responding to behavior? Or mm. is he actually doing what God does in response to the ontology? You know, God... This is why Paul can say, I don't judge anyone according to their persona, their flesh, their false personhood, right? I see beyond that to the truth of who they are. So, so in our forensic model of God, a lot of times we've just reduced God to being a human being who is stuck on behavior mm -hmm. rather than someone who perceives the truth of who we are in response to that and says, you know what? You are a child of God, whether you know it or not. You know, this you're you're my child. This isn't just a Christian religion thing. This no, is a human not race thing. Right. Correct. Right? That is correct. Because we all we all find ourselves bound in this performance thinking that somehow we can appease whatever God it is that we have. So which is exactly one of the pieces I wanted to speak to is that, you know, and Paul talks about lots of layers. One of the layers I see is that um, our biggest delusion is that we are that we don't accept that we're human beings created in the image of god that we feel like we need to be something other than that other than just human and so to your question john about why did jesus have to die i think that he had to take on the full human existence all the way to death and in the lowliest of deaths so that nobody could say you don't know what it's like to be human he, he, like he had to take on the lowliest, not just like die on his, you know, kingly bed in the middle of the night, but the, the worst one so that nobody could say, yeah, but you don't know what it's like to be tortured or betrayed or born a bastard child or whatever. He took on the full human existence at the lowliest level. Hmm. And he's, he, he knows how to be the high priest. Mm-hmm knows how mm -hmm. to, he turned over every leaf in our broken delusional world and he brought his father and the Holy Spirit with him and and in his submission to us and in our rejection of him the Holy Spirit is turning uh, uh, us into the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells it's just it's like you e equals MC square you suddenly it gets reversed and you see it and you go oh my goodness I got to rethink everything I thought I knew now mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. but the delusional thing is the key the fall is is a, a, a deep delusion and there's no way to convince Adam and Eve in, in any other way except by uh, entering into their world uh, and into their delusion. And that gives wow. me hope because otherwise for me, that as a teacher and a preacher, then it, may, it would mean that I have to convince people that my position is right and keep them convinced. But mm -hmm. if Jesus is inside their delusion, my job is to bear witness to that reality and let the Father, Son, and Spirit mm -hmm. convince from the inside out. And I don't have to be right all the time. And I don't have to keep you convinced all the time or keep you entertained. So you'll keep coming back. This is news of what is. It resonates deep within our souls and begins to free us. Roger, Roger what are you thinking? I'm watching you nod a lot. And, <laughs> and I'm, very, I'm very jealous of our time together. Um, well, I was, uh, you know, lots of thoughts were coming by. I was thinking about uh, 1 John chapter 4, where it talks about, you know, Verse 14, God is love. He who dwells in love is dwelling in God and God in him. In love, there is no room for punishment. Indeed, perfect love banishes fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And anyone who's afraid has not attained to love. And so on. Um, so the idea that uh, somehow God's, you know, one of God's primary tools to heal us is to, is to make us afraid seems kind of self-defeating. Mm -hmm. Um, the fear is uh, gets in the way so often. 
And so, what what can God do to try to convince us that He's he, that uh, we ought not to be so full of fear? So, and then you can you can see the incarnation, the coming of God as a human being, and you can see it. Uh, you can see how, in a way, the atonement, the death of Jesus, is almost guaranteed or it's intrinsic. The two really are uh, two sides of, of each other. When God uh, chooses to come and, and be one of us, it means he's, gonna, he's choosing to come all the way to the very depths of our, our darkness, to the very depths of our misunderstandings, to the very depths of our, our brokenness and, our, and our, uh, our, even our sense of abandonment, which is, is a, an ambiguous uh, thing to say the least. And, and so he comes into that, even that, and descends all the way to that. That's, that's, the, uh, that's, that's an important part of understanding why the cross. And it's, I, there, there's nowhere he doesn't go. I, I love that, Roger. And it's not that he just did it 2,000 years ago. He's doing it now. He's doing it today. Mm -hmm. You know, if you feel like you're in isolation today, which I'm sure there's a lot of people that feel <laughs> that right now, he's in it with us. He hasn't abandoned anybody. He hasn't mm. betrayed anybody. He hasn't walked away from anybody. He's never walked away from anyone. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is the thing to me that just, this is why I said it grips our souls. This, this is something that we are experiencing. We are learning. We are processing and being transformed by this, and it sings to us. Um, Just, so even if even if you feel like you're absolutely alone, and maybe absolutely. you physically feel like you are, uh, the gospel says actually there's there's four of you there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Father, Son, yeah. and Spirit, and you. So there's and, always a foursome, and the and the whole human race and creation in Jesus. <laughs> So riffing off Roger here, you know, which is, is very Athanasian, what he's saying, you know, is, is he... Um, but explain Athanasian. Well, just Athanasius. He's, he's, well, he's um, you know, on the Incarnation, <laughs> which is about the cross. It's a book about, it's a book of, it looks like it's written about the birth of Jesus. It's about the cross. And, um, and, and he says that, you know, God sees humans um, falling and not just to death, not to not just into death, but into non-existence, into non-being again. Non -being. And um, the the purpose is God sees this happening. He doesn't want. He doesn't. First of all, God doesn't envy existence to any of His creatures. He wants us to exist with Him, um, and and He doesn't want us to lose existence. So the only way, Athanasius says, the only way that He can arrest our descent into non-being is to become human Himself, to enter into the experience of alienation, suffering, death, um, all the consequences of all of our rebellion to love, all of this. But it's, it's this is the word problem. We, we, we think this is like, you know, God and God. No, God is the one. Um, the, the, the trying God is, um, is taking upon himself all of this, this consequence, all the burden, um, death, everything. And he descends. Antanasi says he falls until he's beneath the lowest falling human being and lifts the human, the one human nature that we all share back into the everlasting yeah. uh, life that they share. Yeah. Um, it's very so. good. It's very good. Do you know the C.S. Lewis riff on that? Yep. yep. Uh, Kevin? Let's hear it. It's a, a great description. Um, Lewis writes, this is from Miracles. He says, in the Christian story, God descends to reascend. He comes down, down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, down into humanity, down further still, if embryologists are right, to recapitulate in the womb ancient pre-human phases of life, down to the very roots and seabed of the nature he has created. But he goes down to come up again and bring the whole ruined world up with him. And these great several images. One has the picture of a strong man stooping lower and lower to get himself underneath some great complicated burden. He must stoop in order to lift. He must almost disappear under the load before he incredibly straightens his back and marches off with the whole mass swaying on his shoulders. Or one may think of a diver first reduced, reducing himself to nakedness, then glancing in midair, then gone with a splash, vanished, rushing down through the green and warm water into black and cold water, down through increasing pressure into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay. 
Then up again, back to color and light, his lungs almost bursting, till suddenly he breaks surface again, holding in his hand the dripping precious thing that he went down to recover. He and it are both colored now, that they have come up into the light. Down below, where it lay colorless in the dark, he lost his color too. <laughs> that's really that's, good. That's Irenaeus, that's Athanasius, and that, you know, Lewis puts it in his own uh, Good way. grief. I, we, I, I need that. I've, I've never, that's in Miracles? <laughs> miracles, miracles, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, the great, uh, I think it's the grand miracle, yeah. For those that's who don't beautiful. know, Ath Athanasius or Athanasius was like a North African 20-something year old in 320-something AD who, who wrote, in, in certain ways, he stepped into a gap that existed and, and uh, in the love of Jesus pulled humanity back in a, in a good direction. Um, but he, he wrote this little book on the incarnation of the word of God in which he says, you know, what was God being good to do? To, you know, Baxter loves this quote and I do too. What was God being good to do seeing that his good creation is on the road to ruin and about to lapse into non-being? Yeah. So. There's another quote in the, in, the, in the book that preceded that from Athanasius that I love. He says, the God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. Come on. <laughs> well, we were out of time. Guys. Oh, I knew man. we would be on this one. We could talk about this one for weeks. Um, it's a big subject. Thanks again. Roger, thank you for joining us. Thanks for reading good this. Good to see you, Dr. Raj which happens you to be too, in you. your book that you quoted. So, but thanks again. Thanks everyone to join us and we'll see you tomorrow, okay? Thank right. you. Blessings. Blessings. Good night. Much love. Blessings. Blessings all. Peace. Bye.